Welcome to the Deep Dive. The July 2025 Texas floods. I mean, over 100 people lost, just tragically, so many children. It's devastating, truly. It is, and it just breaks your heart, and it really forces you to ask, was this just a weather event, a so-called natural disaster? Right, because that term, natural disaster, it can be misleading, can't it? Exactly. Many geographers really push back on it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to dig into today, this idea that you know, maybe there's no such thing. How human choices, policy failures, okay. how they turn a natural hazard into a full-blown catastrophe. Yeah, core of it. So our mission today is to really try and understand that distinction. We're going to explore how Texas's unique geography, uh, a changing climate, and these critical gaps in policy and communication, mm -hmm. how it all came together, mm -hmm. how it amplified this storm's impact so dramatically. Mm -hmm. It's about moving beyond just reacting. You know? Yes. Trying to understand the layers underneath. Our goal here is really to pull together what our sources tell us, help you see that bigger picture. The hills connect. Exactly. With these Texas floods, it wasn't just one thing. It was a collision of elements. And understanding how they intertwine, that's key if we want to learn and hopefully prevent future tragedies like this. Okay, let's unpack this then. Mm -hmm. When we talk about those elements colliding, we really have to start with the ground itself, right? The geography. Absolutely. Texas is hill country. It's got this infamous nickname, Flash Flood Alley. Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, what makes this specific region so uniquely dangerous? It's a fascinating place, geologically speaking, though uh, incredibly dangerous, too. Flash Flood Alley, it's this big crescent of land. Right. It sort of arcs southwest from near Dallas down through San Antonio and then heads westward. Okay. Now picture this. The hills there are really steep mm. and the region is semi-arid. Meaning dry. Yeah, often dry. And the soil is kind of hard, thin. It's not like a deep sponge that soaks up water easily. You got it. So when you get heavy rain, it doesn't soak in much. It just sheets off those hillsides incredibly fast. Straight into the creeks. Straight into shallow creeks and streams. And then there's this other huge factor. The Balcones Escarpment. It escarpment, right. It's basically this big line of steep hills, almost cliffs in places. Warm, moist air blows in from the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. It hits this escarpment, gets forced upwards really quickly, cools down fast, and just dumps rain. Often torrential amounts. Onto that hard ground you mentioned. Exactly. Onto thin soil that quickly gives way to bedrock underneath. So the runoff is immediate and intense. A hydrologist we looked at, Hatim Sharif from UT San Antonio, Yeah, he put it really vividly. He said, water will rise very, very quickly within minutes or a few hours. And that phrase, very, very quickly. I mean, that became a terrifying reality at Camp Mystic on July 4th, didn't it? Absolutely devastatingly so. The National Weather Service, they had a gauge near the camp in Hunt. Oh, yeah. Around 3.0 a.m., it showed the Guadalupe River rising almost a foot. A foot. Every five minutes. Wow. A foot every five minutes? That's yeah. hard to even comprehend. It is. Think about that pace. By 4.30 a.m., just 90 minutes later, the river had surged more than 20 feet. 20 feet. Yeah. Enough water, easily enough to sweep away people, vehicles, even buildings. It just paints this terrifying picture of how fast things escalated. Life or death decisions in moments. Impossible to outrun. It's yeah. horrifying. And this isn't some freak occurrence for Texas, is it? No, sadly not. Texas actually leads the nation in flood deaths by a significant margin. Really? Yeah. Between 1959 and 2019, uh, the data shows 1,069 flood deaths in Texas. Compare that to Louisiana, the next highest, with 693. That's a huge difference. It is. Yeah. And the hill country, specifically Flash Flood Alley, has this grim history. There was another terrible flood back in 1987. Very similar situation. Ten teenagers died being evacuated from a camp. Oh, my God. And even more recently, just June 12th, 2025, San Antonio had a flash flood. Thirteen people die when their cars were swept away. So the geography sets this incredibly dangerous stage. It's the fixed backdrop. Mm. But then climate change seems to be, what, turning up the volume on that danger? How do these broader environmental shifts play into this? That's exactly the right way to put it. It dials up the stakes. The climate connection is critical here. It's yes. pretty fundamental physics, really. A warmer atmosphere can hold more moisture. Simple as that. Right. And when it holds more moisture, the potential for heavier downpours increases significantly, both the likelihood and the intensity. Like a bigger sponge in the sky ready to be squeezed out. That's a good analogy, yeah. And it means we're loading the dice for more extreme rain events, like what we saw in July. Is there specific research linking this event to climate change? There is. A new analysis came out from Climameter. 
they looked at the meteorological conditions leading up to these July sluds. Right. And they found that the setup, which, remember, dropped more than twice the monthly average rainfall in a single day in some places, just couldn't be explained by natural variability alone. So a climate change fingerprint? It strongly suggests that, yes. One of the co-authors, Maria Genesta, a climate scientist at Oxford, she basically said, climate change is already affecting us, so we need to adapt. Adapt, not just mitigate. Exactly. She stressed cutting emissions, of course, but also the urgent need to adapt and, critically, to properly fund forecast services and climate research so we understand what we're facing. Okay, so we have this uniquely dangerous geography. We have climate change making extreme rainfall more likely more intense. Yeah. But you always remind us, and the sources bear this out, it's often human choices that really elevate the risk, right, that turn the hazard into the tragedy. Precisely. Was there one single biggest human factor here, or is it like a whole web of things? It's definitely a web. But a really major thread, one that climate scientist Daniel Swain pointed out quite forcefully, was what he called the last mile failure. The last mile meaning getting the warning out. Exactly. Forecast and warning dissemination. The National Weather Service, they actually did issue an urgent warning for that July 4th flood. It went out shortly after 1 a.m. So the forecast itself wasn't necessarily the problem. No, the forecast was indicating extreme danger. The problem, the catastrophic failure, was getting that warning to the people who desperately needed it, specifically the campers at Camp Mystic. Why didn't it reach them? multiple reasons. Most were asleep, obviously. Camp rules often ban phones or kids don't have them. Cell coverage in that part of the hill country is notoriously patchy anyway. Right. And even if they got a warning trying to figure out escape routes, judge the water in the pitch black of night, it's incredibly difficult and dangerous. So the warning existed, but it hit a wall. It never reached the end users. That's the last mile failure. And when you dig into why that last mile failed, I mean, it reveals this really troubling, long-running situation right there in Kerr County where the camps are. It does. It's not a new problem. For years, the county commissioners there had considered installing modern flood warning systems. Sirens, digital alerts, that kind of thing. To replace what? What do they have? Basically, an informal word-of-mouth system. Camp staff relied on radios to warn each other. Wow. Okay. But our sources, they point to meeting minutes from back in 2016. Officials called even just studying the feasibility of sirens a little extravagant? Extravagant. To study saving lives. That was the term used. Mm -hmm. And they suggested sirens would mainly just help tourists, not locals. You know, I read that quote from Commissioner H.A. Buster Baldwin. I mean, it's just, it stops you in your tracks. That's like something. He actually said, and I'm quoting directly here, the thought of our beautiful Kerr County having these damn sirens going off in the middle of the night I'm going to have to start prinking again to put up with y'all. Yeah. I mean, beyond memorable, it's just such a painful insight into this resistance to change, this attitude that ultimately costs lives. It shows a deep-seated resistance. And that attitude, that debate, it continued for years. Yeah. Fast forward to 2021, residents were apparently showing strident opposition in meetings. Opposition to what specifically? To using federal funds for warning systems, particularly if those funds were tied to the Biden administration. Politics entered the picture. So resistance on cost grounds, political grounds, maybe even just inertia. It seems like a mix of all those things. Maybe a sense that we've always managed this way or a distrust of outside solutions. I can maybe see an argument, playing devil's advocate, that some locals might trust their own network more than a government siren. Is there a cultural element, too? That's a fair point to raise. There can absolutely be cultural resistance, a preference for local control, skepticism about big government, concerns about noise or aesthetics, too. Right. But the brutal reality highlighted by this tragedy is that those informal systems, however well-intentioned or community-based, they just couldn't cope. Not with the speed, the scale of this event, the science, the data. It all points to needing reliable, official, widespread warnings that work even when cell service is down or it's 3 a.m. And the tragedy definitely seemed to galvanize people, didn't it? That resistance maybe started to crack. It certainly sparked a public outcry. You had people like Nicole Wilson, a San Antonio mother whose daughters almost went to Camp Mystic that summer. Yeah, I read about her petition. She launched a change.org petition urging Governor Abbott to finally approve a modern warning network. Her plea was just heartbreaking. Five minutes of that siren going off could have saved every single one of those children. Just five minutes. It highlights the desperate need 
for a system that simply wasn't there. Exactly. And this last mile warning failure, it's really a symptom, isn't it? It points to broader vulnerabilities in policy and preparedness. Like what else? Well, beyond the warning systems, you have issues like funding for federal agencies. The National Weather Service, like others, faced deep staffing cuts under the previous administration, President Trump's. Right. Now, Experts we looked at stressed the NWS forecasters on the ground did perform admirably given the circumstances, but underfunding is a chronic issue. Okay, what else? Unwise development. The hydrologist, Hatim Sharif, he pointed this out too. Summer camps love the beauty of the hill country, understandably. Mm -hmm. But treating sites in such a high-risk flood zone as safe or permanent places for large groups of people, especially children, that needs rethinking given the increasing risks. So land use decisions are crucial. Absolutely. Yeah. And then there's the whole issue of driver behavior and road safety during floods. Ah, uh, yes. The car is being swept away. It's a huge factor in Texas flood deaths. Our sources say 58% over six decades involve vehicles. 68%? Why so high? People often tragically underestimate the power of moving water. They think their truck or SUV is safe. But it's not. No. Just one or two feet of moving water can easily lift and sweep away even large vehicles. Remember that June 12 San Antonio flood? Yeah. Drivers caught in the early morning, poor visibility, yeah. swept away. It happens again and again. And that ties into urban planning too, right? Like in San Antonio. Yes. Briefly, things like large paved areas mean more runoff, less mm -hmm. absorption. Outdated drainage systems can't handle the volume. It all adds up, exacerbating the risk, especially in urban settings. It's just this complex, heartbreaking convergence of geology, climate, policy failures, individual choices. It really is. But what's interesting and maybe hopeful is that even though the challenges are immense, the paths forward seem pretty clear. It's not like we don't know what needs to be done. Exactly. The solutions are identifiable. It starts with just fundamental understanding and adaptation. Understanding. People need to truly grasp why flash flooding happens there and just how incredibly, terrifyingly fast the water can rise. We have to adapt to the changing climate reality. It's not just about cutting emissions anymore. It's about living with more frequent, more intense events. Okay, adaptation. Then what? Forecasting itself needs improvement. Hydrologist Sharif makes a strong case for using hydrologic forecasts more. Meaning? Forecasts that don't just predict rainfall amounts, but translate that into likely river levels. You know, answer the question. If we get 10 inches of rain here, what will actually happen to the river? That sounds much more actionable. It is. We also need more detailed modeling water physics, velocity, and probabilistic forecasting. That means planning for the worst case scenarios, not just the most likely ones. Preparing for the extremes. Yes and developing clear scientific frameworks that link those forecasts to specific local impacts. Stream flow, flood depth, water velocity, information that actually helps officials make timely calls on evacuations or road closures. And educating the public, especially drivers. Absolutely critical. That 58% vehicle death statistic, it tells you everything. People need constant reminders. Turn around, don't drown. It sounds simple, but it saves lives. And officials taking action like closing roads. Yes. Officials need to be more proactive about barricading roads when flood risk is high, prevent people from driving into danger in the first place, and of course, investing in those modern, robust, multi-layered warning networks. That warning network point really hits home after hearing about Kerr County. It's about getting people the information they need when they need it through multiple channels. Sirens, digital alerts, opt-in systems, ensuring it reaches everyone. It really does make you question assumptions, doesn't it, about what preparedness looks like instead of just sticking with how we've always done it. This whole deep dive into the Texas floods, it's such a tragic, stark illustration. Geography, climate change, human policy failures, all colliding. Right. And if you connect that to the bigger picture, it really hammers home why just calling these things natural disasters can be so inadequate. It often masks the human element, the points where intervention was possible. And understanding those layers, those points of failure and potential intervention, that's where you, the listener, gain some agency, some power. Mm -hmm. It lets you see the levers for change, yeah. the areas where we can and should demand better planning, better policies, better warnings. It moves us beyond just feeling helpless. Absolutely. It encourages informed action. So thinking about all this. It does raise an important question, doesn't it, for you listening right now? Given everything we've unpacked about the Texas floods, the geography, the climate, the human systems, what's one thing you might reevaluate? 
maybe about flood risk in your own community, or even just how you interpret news about disasters going forward. What's one assumption you might question? Exactly. And is there some action, even a small one, you can maybe explore? Learning more, talking to local officials, checking your own preparedness, something to contribute to better understanding and safety where you are. It's definitely something to think about.